So now that we've given a background on Java 8, some of its functional programming features, now that you've gotten a little bit more knowledge about concurrency and parallelism, now we're going to start showing how the advanced features in Java 8 work. And we're going to start by talking about Java 8 streams, which are a very cool new set of things, new, new to Java at least. People have been doing this for a while in other languages, but it's new to Java. And uh, so what we'll do in this part of the lesson, this is actually a multi-part lesson, is we'll describe the structure and functionality of streams at a fairly high level. And I'll talk about the fundamentals, which are these things called aggregate operations. And I'll use a running example to illustrate the key points. You can download that example, as always, from my website. And uh, you'll see it's, it's a very simple example that just kind of illustrates how to make a stream and to do simple things. In particular, we will not talk about the parallelism stuff right away. And you'll, you'll see why, because there's plenty to learn without throwing parallelism into the mix. And moreover, the other cool thing is once you understand the basics that we cover here and you decompose your problem right, the parallelism stuff usually just comes along almost for free from the point of view of programming effort. There may be some overhead you have to worry about in terms of the overhead from the runtime, but we'll get to that later. And this, of course, by the way, this is also a segue into the next programming assignment where you'll start to do some stream stuff. I'll put that out a little bit later. OK, so let's talk about Java 8 streams. So what are streams? They were something that were added to Java and the Java class library that provide a number of benefits to programs. And if you take a look, you can if you take a look at the documentation. You'll, you'll see they talk about what was added and when it was added. This was added in 2014 timeframe. One of the things you can do with a stream is you can manipulate flows of data in a declarative way. If you recall when we talked about functional programming, I talked about how functional programming was really about composition of functions. That's one of the key themes in the functional model. And again, depending on various things, if you do it right, then uh, oftentimes you'll be able to have the input of one function or one phase or one stage be based on the output of the stage that came before it. And that just gets kind of composed together in a pipeline. So as we'll see, this, the stream will be used to express what operations to perform, not specifically how to perform them. That's done by the framework <laughs> under the hood that's implementing all this stuff. So this is, this is that little flow I've talked about many times where you, you filter out images that um, have already been cached. You download the images that have not been cached. You apply filters, and you collect everything into a list. The other thing you can do with streams, which is really the, the key thing that we're going to focus on here once we get past the basics, is you can transparently parallelize your program without the need to write any multi-threaded code. So that's the cool part. You don't have to write the code that does the threading and the starts and the joins and all the other stuff. That's done for you under the hood. And the framework, the streams framework, the parallel streams framework, will automatically map the chunks of data elements in the partition stream to the underlying processor cores. And most of the time, it'll do a better job than you're likely to be able to do by yourself. Not all the time, but most of the time. So what's a stream? A stream is basically a pipeline of aggregate operations that process a sequence of elements, also known as values. They're really objects, but we call them values for various reasons, as you'll see later on. <clears throat> and so you basically have this pipeline. As you can see here, literally, you have a pipeline of aggregate operations that map input to output in a composed way. So you can think of a stream as essentially, at least conceptually, unbounded. You could have an unbounded stream. It would go on forever. But of course, in practice, they're typically bounded because of practical constraints, if nothing else. Usually, it's because you have a limited set of input. But in theory, you can generate an infinite stream. And that's actually ridiculously easy to do, probably too easy to do in Java, uh, as we'll show later. Here's our simple example. So this is going to be a program that's going to take a list of character names from the play Hamlet, classic William Shakespeare play. It's going to only continue to process character names that start with the letter H, either uppercase or lowercase. It's going to filter out anything that doesn't start with uppercase or lowercase H. 
it will then capitalize the name, so they'll all start with a capital letter and then all be lowercase after that. It'll sort them, and then it'll print them all out after they're sorted. So that's what the stream is doing. That's how you read that. Stream of, list of character names, filter out the stuff that doesn't start with H, capitalize them consistently, sort them, print them. That's the stream we're going to look at. Well, how do you get a stream in the first place? A stream is typically created by something called a factory method. So remember factory method pattern? Hopefully you remember that from 251 or other courses about design. If, you, if some of these patterns are not familiar to you, take a look at the links. They'll tell you more about them. So we have a stream of, and we just list out the names. There's, there's other ways to do this, by the way, but that's one way to do it. And what happens under the hood is we basically end up taking this array of strings, which is what this is. We have an array of strings, and then that's converted by the of operation into a stream of strings. So the of factor method converts an array of type t, which in this case t is string, into a stream of t. OK, pretty straightforward. You can read more about of here, but it's very simple. There are lots and lots and lots of other ways to make streams. We'll see a bunch of them. We'll see stream, parallel stream, split as stream. We already saw stream of. There's just a whole pile of them down here, about a dozen or so to do that. Once you've got yourself a stream, however you get yourself a stream, then you can perform aggregate operations on each element in the stream. And the way this is done is by aggregate operations that are past a behavior. And by the way, tying this back together to our earlier discussion, these behaviors are implemented by lambda expressions or method references. So all the stuff we talked about before, we talked about function interfaces, we talked about predicates, we talked about by functions, consumers, suppliers, et cetera, and there's by consumers and by suppliers and so on. Those are the kinds of things that are passed as the parameter or parameters to the aggregate operations in a stream. So here's a simple example. Map is an aggregate operation. We'll see more about that later. It's a very common one. And we're passing in a behavior, which is a method reference to a function that will capitalize the first character in whatever it's getting. I'll come back and talk a bit more about what the difference is between the aggregate operation and behavior shortly. For right now, think of it this way. Remember, a stream is a stream of data elements. And the aggregate operation will be used to call the behavior on each element in that stream. So the aggregate operation, as the name implies, aggregates the behaviors that are applied to the data elements that are flowing through the operation in the stream. Ideally, and this, 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 this sometimes is violated for various reasons, ideally the behavior, uh, a behavior's output only depends on its input argument or input arguments. In other words, there should be no side effects. Again, that is not always the case, but that's what we strive for. So here's a simple example. Notice capitalize takes a string. It checks to see what the length is. If the length is 0, it just returns the 0 string. Otherwise, it uppercases the first character and then lowercases everything else. Notice how this has no side effects. In other words, it doesn't modify any other state. It just modifies the parameters that are passed in. The behaviors with the side effects are, if you have behaviors with side effects and you aren't really careful in how you deal with them through synchronizers or some other means, you will likely end up with really bad race conditions and your program will do bizarre things. And I'll show you some examples of that later to make it really clear what kind of bad things will happen. Once again, only you can prevent race conditions. You have to write your code in a way to do that. The easiest way to do that is to write stateless lambda expressions. And, and by the way, I want to clarify one thing, because someone asked a really good question the other day on the uh, forum. So our goal is to try to make things stateless. But there are certain things in Java, because it's also an object-oriented language, that are not stateless. So for example, if you have a hash map or a concurrent hash map, or an array, you're setting and getting, right? You're adding, you're putting and getting, and you're changing things and so on. Those operation implementations are updating state. Now, of course, if you're worried about concurrency, they're doing it in a way that's thread safe with all the other good properties of synchronized objects. But there are things that are being updated. 
So it's not that there's no state updates in Java. It's just that we try to minimize them and we only use them when absolutely necessary. And at the moment, it's more efficient to do mutable collections than it's often more useful to do uh, mutable collections than immutable ones, although there are also plenty of immutable collections in Java 2, like Java string, for example. OK, so, so what do streams buy us? Well, they make our programs more flexible by making this pipeline of processing behaviors that can chain together multiple aggregate operations. So again, it's like a bucket brigade. You put input in at the start, and then you transform, output, take that as input, transform, output, take that as input, transform, output, and so on. So you can compose things together in various ways. Here's a picture that kind of illustrates this. You'll see I try in, in many places to visualize the concepts that we'll also look at in code. So I'll show you the visualization first, and then we'll look at the code that actually does it. So here you can see that we have a, uh, a stream pipeline. And, and I'll show you the code in a second. I think it's on an upcoming slide. Um, and what we're going to do here is we're going to take an array of strings. We're going to you know, turn it into a stream. We're going to end up with a stream of strings. We're going to filter those things. Notice by when we filter this, we get rid of anything that doesn't start with H. So poor Laertes gets left behind, but Horatio and Hamlet still get through the filter. Then we're going to go ahead and map this stream to that stream. We're going to capitalize the first letter and everything that's left over. We're going to sort it. So Hamlet goes first. And we end up ultimately with a stream of sorted names that we turn into a list. So that's just kind of a high level view. Internally, a stream holds no non-transient storage. So that means if your program crashes and you, your stream was in midstream, the data was in midstream, it's lost. So you are responsible for persisting it if you need it to be persisted. Every stream works in a very similar way. That's, by the way, one of the big wins. It makes your code have a common look and feel, sort of principle of least surprise design approach. You start with a source of data, like a stream of uh, an array of uh, names or whatnot, or a collection. You could have a collection. Here's another way to do this. So here we have an array. Here we have a list, which is a collection. And we say characters.stream. So that both of those generate streams with the same information. And then we go ahead and process the data through the pipeline of intermediate operations. So it comes in, we process it. Here's an example of intermediate operations. Common intermediate operations you'll get to know and love in this class will be filter, map, and so on, flat map. And then finally, we end up with a terminal operation that gives a non-stream result. Notice that the intermediate operations are going to take streams as input, do something to the stream, and then output the results as a stream. So the key way to remember what an intermediate operation is, it takes a stream as input and produces a stream as output. In contrast, so-called terminal operations, which are also aggregate operations because they work in aggregates, they will not yield a stream result. So for example, printing the result out doesn't yield a stream. It just, it's sort of the, the terminal operation in this stream. The other thing that a terminal operation does is it triggers the processing of the other intermediate operations in a stream. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you later, that means that streams are lazy. We'll, we'll see what that means. So these terminal operations can do several things. They might yield no value at all. So for each does not yield a value, although printf prints a result, but it doesn't yield a value coming back through the for each method. So that's one thing that they can do. The other thing that they can do is they might yield a collection. So here's an example where we're going to do all this transformation to our characters, our Hamlet characters. And then we're going to collect the results into a list and store it as a list. So that's another thing you can do with a terminal operation. You can collect it into some data structure. Um, we'll talk about this later. Don't worry too much about the details now. You can have really powerful collectors. For example, here's a way to take that stream and now we're going to collect the results into a map that has the character name followed by the length of each name. And we simply use the grouping by collector. And grouping by is kind of like uh, if you ever had to sort silverware. You know, you put all the big forks into one 
tray, part of the tray. You put the small forks into another part of the tray. You put the knives into one part of the tray, right? It groups them together so that they're organized into a map. And the last thing you can have is something called a primitive value. So for example, here, we're going to go through our map and we're going to reduce the result so that we end up with a count of the lengths of the number of characters that we have in our, in our uh, list of Hamlet characters. And reduce is a really cool method. It's, it's, if you ever heard of map reduce, well, reduce is the reduce in map reduce. Map is the map in map reduce, by the way. We'll come back to that later. So what we're doing here is we're going to give it an identity value. I'll talk more about identity later. And then what it's going to do is for every pair of, of numbers in this map, it's going to add those values together. So two becomes one. And then you take another two, and they become one. So you're basically having a tree of computations that end up with a single result when all is said and done. This is called an accumulator. We'll talk more about that. And uh, there's also a, a third parameter, a three-parameter version of this that is used for parallel streams. So these are things that are actually going to be done in parallel. And we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that. If you watch this video down here, you can learn more about it if you're curious. There can only be one terminal operation. So just like there can only be one abstract method in a functional interface, there can only be one terminal operation in a stream. And that's the thing that generates the results. By default, all these, aggregation, all these aggregate operations will run sequentially in one thread of control. And that's what we're going to focus on first. But without too much work, you can switch from using sequential processing to parallel processing. And when that happens, then the framework breaks things up into chunks, uses this thing called the common fork join pool to run them in parallel. And we'll cover that shortly. But the good news is that everything you learned first about sequential streams will transfer directly to parallel streams, which is really the, the focus. Okay, so that is the end of the material.